Hi. So I keep sort of dangling this promise in the lectures of talking about infinity and doing an introduction to calculus as a result. And today we're going to start finally putting some things together and doing just a little bit of that by talking about something called instantaneous velocity, or for today it might more accurately be known as instantaneous speed, which is the thing that a speedometer needle in a car shows you. And so before we do that though, because to quote, um, I think it's Mr. Incredible, uh, we get there when we get there. So we're gonna talk for a minute though about what I left off talking about last time, which is measuring time. Right, because time, even more so than space, we often end up with problems of we don't necessarily have easy to use reference standards because the way we measure physical quantities is we come up with some reference and we count up how many of that reference fits inside of some other thing, either in space, in time, or in mass, which we haven't talked about and we'll talk about later down the line, right? Because in, in things like chemistry, um, you talk about all sorts of quantities, right? So in uh, physics, though, we only talk about three things, mass, length, and time, or distance and time. And mass is not weight. We'll talk about that later. Turns out they're generally the same, but they're slightly different concepts. But for now, we're only thinking about space and time. And so if you're if you're a chemist, uh, I've got my periodic table mug here. Where's element 40? Yeah. Oh, the, I, I always do. Uh, I like the element molybdenum um, because it's element number 42. And then just like the number 42, uh, the element molybdenum seems to, keem, seems to keep fortuitously coming up in my career. And so... I thought I would mention that. But, you know, if you're a chemist, you might say, you know, how many atoms of molybdenum are there? Or you might ask, you know, uh, st different specific questions about a material, and you might define different numbers that, you know, I could define the Erica number for, like, you know, my desk. And I could, you know, come up with some way that you measure the Erica number, and then uh, everybody does that. But, uh, you know, and, and, you know, it'd be a useful quantity. But uh, in physics, we constrain ourselves to, to those three things, uh, mass, length, and time. So, you know, so, you know, we basically talk about, like, how much stuff is there, how much space does it have to fit in, and how much time does it have to exist. Or really what we talk about is how heavy objects are or more accurately, how massive they are, where they are, and when they are in that location. And so the trickiest of those to measure in many respects is time. But in all cases, you have the same issue, that you need to pick some standard and then count it up, and you're going to have two problems, no matter what, is if your reference is too long, right? If you want to measure something that's only, say, half a meter long and all you have is a meter stick, you have a problem, right? And also, if you want to measure something that's, say, a kilometer long and all you have is a meter stick, you technically don't have a problem, you just have a lot of work to do. So we're going to tend to look for things that are smaller references rather than larger references so that we don't have this problem of granularity. And so with time, this is particularly dicey because the only natural thing we had originally was days, and days are very slow. And so it's very difficult. Like this example I keep using of if you're, say, commuting to work and back, and, you know, it's, you are traveling, say, you know, maybe five miles, or I guess, you know, it's, oh, uh, shoot, I should really know this, you know, what is that, eight kilometers? And you want to measure how much time that takes. Well, you need something that can both take the same amount of time every time it happens, and that can do that over a duration of time equal to your commute. Right, so I used this example last time of a pendulum, which this one happens to take about one second to swing back and forth. So, let's see, 
one hippopotamus, two hippopotamus, three hippopotamus, four hippopotamus, five hippopotamus, six hippopotamus, and so on and so forth, right? And you just count up how many se seconds have elapsed. Or in this case, it's not really seconds, it's swings of this particular pendulum, which happens to be about one second. So there are modern techniques we have that are very stable, but something like a pendulum, right? If you're, if you're driving around and it's, 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 it's sort of oscillating, you, you, you don't run into a fundamental problem, but the, the, the way that we measure time is we just, we, we, we have these, right? I mean, you know, I, I mean, in practice, right? If, if I, as a person, want to know how long something takes, I, what I do, I take out my phone, I open up, you know, the timer app, and I start a stopwatch. So that's what we're going to do later in this lecture, is I'm going to show you some data using a stopwatch. But my goal is that by the end of just this classical mechanics course, you will have a decent understanding of how your phone measures time and how something like a car's odometer can measure distance. And we're going to learn how to deal with that data a little bit today. But for now, uh, how the timer on your phone works is just magic, and it tells you how much time has elapsed. And the odometer on a car is just magic. I, I'd say your car, but uh, I think basically everybody has a phone. I don't think everybody actually has a car. I'd say the majority of people do, especially in the United States, but not everybody. So, but certainly everybody, I think, is, is familiar with uh, an odometer. And so, you know, ultimately it's something like this, where the phone is taking some process that happens at a regular interval and counting up how many times it happens on your way to work. So then how does that tie into this concept of infinity? Well, it's a little bit subtle. And to do that, let's just define what speed is. So speed, very simply, is just how much distance you travel uh, over the amount of time elapsed. There's a subtlety that speed has to do with how much distance you travel, and velocity has to do with how much distance you traverse. So it's, it's a question of, if you remember back at this example of the winding path versus the direct straight path, there is multiple possible path lengths, aren't there? You could take this route, or you could take this route, and you'll end up the same amount of distance as, uh, as the, this is like they say, the, the, the expression for better or worse is as the crow flies, right? So the distance as the crow flies from start to finish is one kilometer no matter what, but depending on the exact path you take, the distance you actually travel over the ground can be different. And so strictly speaking, Speed refers to the rate at which you are traveling over the ground, not the rate at which you are making progress towards your destination, or just in a particular direction at all. But so for today, those are going to be essentially the same thing, because the data is going to be me just driving down the highway at 40 miles an hour at more or less constant speed and in pretty much a straight line. So we're not going to have to worry too much about the distance between speed and velocity today. But speed refers to how fast you're traveling uh, along your path, and velocity refers to how fast you are actually moving towards a particular object or destination, uh, or away from an object or destination. And so let's say your speed is 60 miles an hour. So that's, you know, 60 miles in one hour, because the definition of speed here is just distance traveled over time elapsed. So 60 miles per hour is 60 miles in one hour, 60 MPH, or if you want to use, oh, excuse me, I had to belch a bit. Uh, if you want to use sane normal units is 96.6 uh, .6 kilometers per hour. So, okay, that's all fine and good. Why, why do I have this, this, this other thing that you may have seen written below there? Um, because, well, it all goes back to the obsession that uh, has driven me to madness all these years, uh, but that has at least driven me towards a uh, halfway decent physics education, uh, which is Zeno's paradox. So 
if Zeno were instead, or, or sorry, if Achilles, because it's Zeno's paradox talking about Achilles, if Achilles were driving a car at 60 miles an hour or 96 kilometers or 97 kilometers per hour rather than just running, uh, how would we analyze things differently? Because certainly the car does not stop rolling along the ground. Uh, Achilles has to maybe take steps, so you could start creating some granularity out of that. But uh, the car is a cleaner example for the way we want to think about it today, because the wheels just roll along the ground. So 96.6 kilometers in 1.00 hours. Don't worry too much about significant figures, although I uploaded a separate tutorial on that if you want to take a look at that. And so, okay, 97 kilometers per hour, 96.6 is, but it should have three significant figures because it started with three. But, um, you know, I, I'm playing fast and loose with them here. So 96.6 kilometers per hour, okay, well, that's also equivalent to 48.3 kilometers in 0 0.5 hours because it's true that the car also has to get halfway there before it gets all the way there, just like Achilles trying to catch up to the tortoise. So, well, okay, that's where you start to realize that this paradox is no paradox at all. Achilles keeps moving just like the car keeps rolling. But, well, there's something interesting to, to explore there, uh, which is, it's still interesting to think about, well, but what if, what, what if you still go down this ridiculous rabbit hole anyways? What if you still ask this question about getting halfway there and getting halfway there and getting halfway there over and over and over again, absolutely ad nauseum. Let's represent that instead of with that cartoon on this sort of number line diagram, where I have a start line at zero and a finish line at one kilometer. And you see, I've now put two pieces of information on there, which are time and distance. So I put the distance on the top and the timestamp on the bottom. So you could see I just made it one minute to go one kilometer so that all the math is nice and simple. Yay, metric system. And so then, okay, but then that means, at, it's not that simple though, because we still have to deal with minutes in increments of 60 seconds. So, but it, in, in physics, we generally don't deal in things like minutes very often. We almost always just leave everything in seconds and then use scientific notation to represent the amount of time. That way we don't have to deal with things like hours and days but it's uh, a very useful mental math to be able to go back and forth. So, okay, but, you know, so if it takes uh, one minute to go one kilometer, it should take 30 seconds to go 500 meters, and then, okay, that, uh, that all makes sense. You're just going at a constant speed, then it should take 15 minutes to go 250 meters. It should take uh, seven and a half minutes to go 125 meters, but, okay, so then that's seven and a half minutes, so that's the first moment that you, like, might say, okay, so now we just have to introduce these finer, finer units to, to make this work. And uh, if you really want to preview down the road is the, if you really watch all of these lectures, and I mean all of them, to the point where we get to the graduate level, you will develop uh, understanding to properly frame the question of, are space and time continuous or discrete? And the answer is they're probably continuous, but there's some interesting thoughts about this in quantum mechanics that if you want to learn, uh, keep watching, and also like, share, and subscribe. We all do what we do. So now let's take this one-dimensional information, and instead of representing space in the bottom of the number line, or sorry, yeah, here we are bringing space at the above the number line and time below the number line. So let's just instead use the technique that we all learn in middle school algebra and represent it in this form where we represent one variable in the vertical axis and the other variable in the horizontal axis, right? So instead of doing this thing where we can always take it back to this, right? Where it's like you're moving along this line and then there are these pieces of data that you want to keep track of that tell you where you are at particular moments in time. And we're instead going to represent that in this two-dimensional format, where now our path looks like this, right? Where, you know, the start is here, the finish is here. Uh, but now, instead of, you know, representing the timestamps uh, this way, we're representing them this way. But now, uh, this is not necessarily going to be uh, such, a, such a simple line anymore. Uh, so we're going to need to get comfortable with this representation of, typically, as a physicist, we're going to do spa space on the vertical axis and time on the horizontal axis, because that's how physicists do things. 
And we're going to learn how to understand space and time that way. Because, which is kind of interesting, right? Because it's using spatial information to represent temporal information, which now that I'm able to record that on a video, I'm now adding temporal information back into. Uh, but I, rather than using animations, um, am doing this. And I may start using animations and stuff at some point, but I will explain not just how the animation works as a concept, but I will actually literally explain how I made the animation and what the mathematical parameters in it are. So there may be animations on this channel, but they will never be in that style. And that's not because I think that's bad, it's because these are intended to be lectures that really give you the full content. So it's it tended to sort of be a little bit of that dude whoa inspiration, but mostly with the traditional university lecture content. And it's a supplement to both rather than a replacement for either. So this is how we represent space and time on a graph like that. And so then what if I want to do this super pedantic thing that I was mentioning from earlier of I want to zoom in further and further and say, okay, what about halfway? What about halfway? What about halfway? And on this, it just, okay, well, I just zoom in more and more and more. And it's like, you see, the answer is, you know, nothing special happens. It's just, you know, the line converges back at the origin the same way it did when we were representing it the other way. So there's a subtlety there though that does finally get back to this thing I was talking about with infinity. And it has to do with the way we represent quantities. Because if you're a chemist and you want to know how many molybdenum atoms or how many sulfur atoms, uh, because I, as a, I worked on the physics properties of the compound molybdenum disulfide, but say you want to know how many molybdenum atoms there are, you know, okay, well, in principle, that's just a number of atoms, and you could count them up. And yes, we know that in modern times we can split the atom, uh, although it's not a very good idea unless you're being very careful, because radioactive contamination from fission processes is... It can be managed, but it's very hazardous. But, you know, you can in principle count the number of atoms, right? Even if you could split them, they're a thing that exists and you count how many there are. Space, it's that we are counting how many references fit in the space, right? And so if there's an amount of space that doesn't quite line up with, with, how, with the, the, the size of our references, you know, we, we can't just declare it out of existence, right? Uh, with, with, with atoms and molecules, if there's nothing there, there's nothing there. And in quantum mechanics, we'll bring all that together and explore some things there, but for purposes of understanding classical physics, you have to understand that the space in between always exists and the time in between always exists. And that means we have to deal with those things mathematically in a way that we wouldn't have to worry about if we were just counting up atoms of some particular type or molecules of some particular type. So I'm going to show you some data now which is data from driving my car. And so you'll now see, instead of a line, I have a bunch of dots. So what's up with that? Well, what's up with that is I drove my car and we're gonna do something now that I haven't done yet, which is to actually pull up a real actual video and do some editing. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, a lot of things. I'm driving my car. I have my phone mounted to the steering wheel so that it records the instruments. And what are those instruments? Well, one of them isn't really in the car. It's the timer, which I just edited onto the top. It's just an ordinary cell phone timer. And well, there's the RPM needle, which I want you to just ignore for now. And there's the speedometer on the right, which we're going to take note of. And then there's the thing I really want you to pay attention to, which is the odometer. And of course, the odometer just tells you how much distance you have traveled over the ground. And how exactly does it do that? Well, for now, it's just magic, but it just uses the gear ratios in your cars and how much the engine has 
turned to figure out how far you've gone. And so then what we're going to do is watch me drive one mile and see how long it takes to arrive at each 0.1 mile mark and see how fast I was driving at each moment like that. So, ready? Three, two, one, go! All right, let's get my speed up. Starts at zero. Speed limit on this road is 40 miles an hour, so I'm gonna get up to around that. And slow down, there's traffic and things like that. Point one. Point two. Point three. Point four. zero. Okay, there we go. Okay, well, this will hopefully give me a chance to polish my editing skills now. So what I want you to do, though, is go back and rewatch the previous two minutes of the video where I was driving, and I want you to pause it every single time it hits another 0 0.1 miles, and I want you to write down the timestamp from that timer at that moment. And of course, also write down the distance, but it's going to be 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, etc. And we are going to analyze that data a little bit. And we're going to analyze it a little bit right now and a lot next lecture. So what we do is we plot it like this. Because remember, before I was saying, just imagining these halfway points and saying, okay, you know, I want to go a halfway and then a quarter way and then an eighth and a sixteenth and so on and so on and so forth. Um, now we don't have that, right? Now we have something very different where we're not thinking about it, we're actually measuring it. So the space in between our measurements exists and the time in between our measurements exists. And in fact, in the case of the video, you can explicitly see that because, well, their video still captures in between when it hit 0 0.1 mile marks, but you also, if you really get down to it, have a problem that the video has a finite frame rate. And so the frame doesn't necessarily happen at exactly the right moment. You know, there's one frame where it's reading, say, 0 0.2, and then in the next frame it's reading, say, 0 0.3, and you don't know the exact moment because you have a distance before and a timestamp before, and you have a distance after and a timestamp after. And so if you really want to, you can do the timestamp halfway in between, but it's going to be precise enough for now. But there's sort of some philosophically interesting things there, aren't there? So what happens if you plot this data like this, where you represent, like I said, the distance on the vertical. So every 0.1 miles is one mark on this graph paper, so that, you know, this 1.0 mile mark is at 10 graph paper markings. So, you know, I set the vertical position of each dot based on how far I've driven, and the horizontal position based on how long it took me to get there, and I get what approximately looks like a straight line. And so that's just like what I had before 
with this constant speed. But you may notice in the video, my speed isn't actually constant, is it? And so, well, this looks like a straight line where I'm going 40 miles an hour, which is the speed limit, which I would never exceed, of course. But if you look at the video, you'll notice there are several points where the speedometer needle goes above 40 miles an hour, doesn't it? So there's some things going on there. And so the speedometer is telling you what's called your instantaneous velocity, or in that case, your instantaneous speed. And so for now, the way it does that is just magic, but we'll explain the actual mechanism later. But what I'm really trying to get at is a particular mathematical tool that we use to understand times and spaces in between points. And that's where we're really going to start getting at this question of what happens when you look, you know, infinitely small space in between your data points, because we're never going to be able to do that with our measurements, right? All you'll get here is a bunch of data points that you can, you, that you can and should graph. And what you can do is you can just look at the last one, which is one mile. And you can look at how long it took to get there, which was, uh, I think also, yeah, one minute and 42 seconds approximately. And you can calculate based on that how fast I was going. And you get, um, I think, slightly above uh, 40 miles an hour. So let's, uh, you know, not delve into that too much. But you get the idea, right, that there's this difference between, okay, how fast are you going on average, which you can calculate from these measurements, versus how fast are you going instantaneously that you can get directly from the speedometer. Uh, but what if you wanted to do that mathematically, right? What if you wanted to actually look infinitely close and say, um, you know, what, what if the average and the instantaneous were the same thing? Because ultimately they have to be, right? If you really, really look over a small enough interval, then you should be able to do it, right? If I'm driving 40 miles an hour, and you only wait one second, then, well, I won't have had time to change my speed very much. And so you can pretty well guess how much distance I will have traveled. And so experimentally and in terms of measuring things, this is a little bit pedantic because, well, you know, you can only measure every 0 0.1 miles. That's like 500 feet. That's, you know, don't really have very good resolution there. Um, but mathematically, we have as much resolution as we want, but uh, mathematically, we then have uh, logical problems that give rise to things like, well, this maddening problem of Zeno's paradox. And so next time, we're going to start talking about uh, actual mathematical functions in the algebraic sense, and we're going to start talking about I, I just keep dangling infinity and calculus in front of you, but we really are going to talk about that soon. So that was a discussion on average and instantaneous velocity. And, well, next time we are going to start talking about how to graph position data in more detail. And we are going to talk about a little bit more calculus. It's it's going to be slow. We're going to I'm going to keep dangling it in front of you and I'm going to keep introducing it very slowly. Um, but the thing we're going to talk about really next time is uh, how, how do you deal with a complicated mess like this, right? Where you go back and forth and you maybe have some complicated path and, how, and then how do you end up graphing it as, as in these these giant complicated messes? And so that's what we're going to talk about next time. Yeah. Thank you for watching.